Today, I want to share with you a message <clears throat> that um, has kind of been on my heart a little bit. There's been many times in my life, and possibly in your life, where you might have felt all alone. You know, you, you may have been surrounded with people, and yet you're still all alone. It, it happens. It happens in our lives. It felt like there was times in my life when I felt like the world was against me, Whatever obstacle I was facing at the time, I felt like it was just me and me alone. And, and I know that's not true. It's not supposed to be that way. But I dare say that even some of us here today have felt the same way, right? Even though, uh, even though there's some of us who, even though on the outside we don't look like we're alone from our appearances or how we live our life, but we're actually inwardly dying because we feel so isolated and so alone. Maybe today, when I said turn around and greet somebody, <clears throat> you watched everybody else greeting, but you felt alone, like nobody cared. You seemed like you might be alone. Today, I have one big thought for you, one big thought, and I'm going to support that with a few things today. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. <clears throat> As a believer in Jesus Christ, the thought is, is you never have to stand alone. You aware of that? As a believer in Jesus Christ, you never, ever have to stand alone. You know, we know that. It's just sometimes hard to live in that. You see, we, as believers, we are created for connection in our lives. But we often, so much of the time, drift towards isolation. Have you ever noticed that? We were created to hang out with God in the Garden of Eden, weren't we? It was a fellowship time. We were created to hang, and, and up until the point to where uh, sin came into the garden, it was, it was not a problem. But when sin entered the garden, what did Adam and Eve do? They isolated themselves. And God is like, Adam, Adam, where are you? Right? He knew where he was. But we were created for connection, but we often just drift towards isolation. And let me unpack that statement just a little bit for you, because we were created to have connection, and, 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 and that is something that's in all of us. We desire it, we crave it, we hunger it uh, with others in our lives. We were created to have connection with God in our lives as well. It's so important. We have this longing, and many of you know that you have tried to fill that deep pain, that deep void in your life with many other things. Why? Because you're looking for a connection with God, but you keep trying to fill it maybe with with alcohol or with, with drugs or with other things that, that seemingly can fill the void, but they really don't. See, today you're here and you're in uh, uh, as a part of the church. And we know, and the sign out in the lobby says, that we don't go to church, but we are the church, right? And we exist to make a difference in this world. That's who we are supposed to be as believers in Christ. And see, Christ is building his church. And it's you, and it's me, and it's you, and it's me, and it's you, and it's you, and it's them up there in the balcony in the never man's land. He's building his church through us. In fact, here's how scripture puts it in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, and it begins in verse 19. And he says, you're no longer strangers or outsiders. That's what he's saying to, to the church in Ephesus. He's writing to them. He's saying, look, 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 look. you got to understand. You are no longer strangers or outsiders. You are citizens. He tells them you're citizens. Another translation of the, of the Bible says that you belong instead of your citizens. It says you belong. It's an understanding that as a believer in Christ, we belong. Paul is telling the church at Ephesus here, you belong here. 
You belong. You are connected to us. You are a part of us. You belong. If you're new to uh, First Assembly, 11 and First Assembly here, uh, maybe this is your first time, maybe you're newer with us. I, I just want you to know you belong here. You are connected here. You are a part of us. You belong here. It doesn't matter what your past may look like, does it? does not. It doesn't matter what your background is, does it? It doesn't matter the color of your skin or the magnitude of your sin, does it? It does not. This is a place where you belong. And then Paul continues on in Ephesians, writing to the church in Ephesus, and he says, after he finishes, you belong, he goes on to say, members of God's, you are citizens and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone of the building blocks. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple to the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God lives by his spirit. His spirit lives in you as a believer of Jesus Christ. He resides in you. He hangs out with you. He comes and fills the void in you and creates a connection to you in a way that only God can do. See, one of the other signs we have here in our lobby that talks about who we are, some of our DNA, if you will, that I want us to have a part of our lives is that we realize our faith journey includes others. Do you know that? Your faith journey has to include other people. You cannot do this alone. God did not say this is an isolated journey, did he? This is for you and you alone, right? No. This is, this is a journey that includes others. It must include others. And it includes others who are sitting here today, but it also includes anyone who are outside of these walls. Right? Our faith journey should include all, everyone. You have as much right as a believer in Jesus Christ to the name Christian as anyone else. God used the apostles. He used the prophets to build a foundation, and and now he's using it inside of you, fitting you in brick by brick, piece by piece, each with a different gift, each with a different part. As, as he describes in another scripture, different parts of the body, literally a hand and a, a foot and, and a thumb. And aren't you, all, aren't you all glad you're not a big toe, right? We each are a different part of the foundation and the brickwork that God has for us. Jesus is the cornerstone of all of that, isn't he? Somebody look, look at your neighbor and tell him you're a stone. Come on, look at your neighbor, tell him you're a stone. Okay, no, not you're a stoner. I heard that, okay? You're a stone. You're a stone. Come on. You're a stone. I'm a stone. Collectively, together, we make up the church. Stone by stone, gift by gift. We we are created to lean on each other, to support each other. Anybody ever have tough times in your life? Okay, those of you who didn't agree with that, you're liars. I'm just saying that right now, okay? That's your problem right there. It starts with lying, okay? We all need to lean on each other. We all need support from one another to draw strength from each other because when one is down, the other can hold them up. Christ talked about how you never want to be disconnected because when one is hurting, the others can help you along, he would say. Why? Because we were created for connection, but unfortunately, we tend to drift towards isolation. We do. Think about it. Even even in our modern technology, all right, even in social media, that's a plus minus thing right there, right? Could be good, could be bad. It's, It's one of those things. Social media is merely a tool that can be used. And a lot of us love social media. You know, I I personally, you know, I, when, we, when we have someone visiting, and I don't necessarily get a name, or maybe I get a first name, or maybe I get a first last name, but again, I'll always go and check them out. Just I want to see who it is and try to reach out to them. And so Facebook is kind of my equalizer there. It helps. 
because a lot of you are all on that. So I really try to connect. Why? Because I want to connect with you. I want to create a connection with you. It's a tool to be used. And, and, and like I said, many of us love it. And that's why so many of us post things on social media. You know, maybe uh, these, these kind of ones drive me nuts. Hey, y'all, I'm doing laundry today. And I'm like, like, I really care you're doing laundry. Right? And I'm going to use a third of a cup of soap today. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Sure. And, and, and yet, what are they trying to do? They're trying to connect with people, right? Or, or you, you, you post the beach picture on a nice sun, sunny, warm beach somewhere, and we post a picture of our hairy legs. We haven't shaved since we left home, right? Hashtag au natural, right? We long for connections. We long connect for those connections. And so what happens is in social media realm, what we do is we post something, and then we rush back to it two minutes later. Okay, okay, who's watching? Who's looking at it? Who liked it? Did I get any emojis? Am I trending yet? You know, tell me I'm not right. <laughs> Come on, I know it's like I'm not going to admit to that one. It's right though. We long for connections with people, and yet social media drives us towards isolation, doesn't it? A lot of times, it can drive us to feel inadequate when we are on social media. You know, it, it happens when we view someone else's highlight pics or their highlight reel or their video uh, of them on vacation. And you're like, geez, man, they're in, they're in some some. Bahamian island somewhere, and I'm, I'm on the Oregon coast, and the wind is whipping, and it's cold out here, right? We, we get jealous. We feel isolated. We tend to feel envious. So we, uh, we watch somebody else's post, and we're like, man, we have FOMO. I remember that acronym, right? Fear of missing out on stuff. We thought we, we, did, we don't want to miss out. And what's crazy is we don't tend to go and talk to somebody about the feelings that we end up with in these moments because of our time on social media, we just bury them deep, right? We, we don't want people to know that. And, and what happens is we continue to isolate ourselves. You know, it, it happens in other areas of our lives as well. I've seen it many, many times uh, in marriages. Have you ever noticed that? In marriages, uh, one spouse begins to drift moving towards isolation instead of moving towards the other spouse. And, and what ends up happening is we see in relationships, if you're not intentional about working towards connection with that individual, you're likely drifting towards isolation. And before you realize it, you've you've finding yourself in a position that you you said you would never make, doing things you vowed you'd never do. Why? Because we're created for connection. But we tend to isolate ourselves. As Christ followers, though, we're called to fight the drift, aren't we? We're called to push against the flow of the drift that goes on in our lives. Everyone say, fight the drift. Come on, say it again. Fight the drift. It's a fight that's worth fighting in our lives in so many ways. It's a battle worth being in because we were created for connection and and to fight that drift towards isolation. And so many of us tend to isolate ourselves. If we can fight that, it can really, really help us a lot in our lives. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this right here. How do we win the fight against the drift towards isolation? How do we win that fight? And there's many, many, many ways, I'm sure. But I want to give you three thoughts today on that, okay? So if you're taking notes, you can write these three thoughts down on how to fight against the drift. The first one is this. Remember the faithfulness of God. Sometimes in our isolation, we forget about who God is and that he's actually resident within us as believers in Jesus Christ. Right? Remember the faithfulness of God. Everybody needs God, don't we? We need to remember His faithfulness in our lives. Moments and marker moments when things that He did for us are so important that when it gets hard, we can go back to those marker moments and go, yes, I do remember God is right there. And, and, and it renews our faith once again. It renews our hearts. The most important connection in your life is your connection with God. Do you realize that? I mean, you think about it, because like I said earlier, so many times we as humans, many of us have spent days, months, years trying to fill that void that only God can fill, that our body is longing for, our heart, our soul needs that connection to God, and we try to fill it with many, many other things. That connection is one of the most important connections. When you surrender your life to Christ, When you enter into a relationship with your Heavenly Father and you're walking with God, 
the great news is that God is actually walking with you. You're not walking alone. I love the footprints in the sand uh, poem that's out, and there's a picture out there. And, and, uh, and the, the poem basically talks about how, you know, I always felt like I was walking alone, and there was two prints, and there was one print, and then later on there's two prints, and God was saying, no, that was when I was carrying you. You weren't alone. I had picked you up and carried you. He is with you. He walks with you. You'll face your troubles in life with him. You'll walk through difficult times in your life, but know that God is always in pace and even ahead of you in your life, isn't he? He's faithful to you. When you stop and look, you begin to realize that you never stand alone because God is with you. Even in the hardest of hard times, he is with you. With God by your side, you're always going to look back on those hard days. You're going to see Him, and you're going to see that His faithfulness in those hard days was what carried you through and that He was always by your side. He was always right where you needed to be, Him to be when you needed Him. And so the first thing you need to do in this fight against the drift is to stop and remember the faithfulness of God. You know, I was reminded when I was looking this through and trying to figure out what all to share. I was reminded of the story of the Israelites when they were getting ready to go into the promised land. The, 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 they had been delivered out of Egypt. Let me just kind of set this moment up that I want to get to. They were delivered from Egypt in slavery for decades and hundreds of years, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years for their disobedience. Catch on to that one for yourself, please. <laughs> And God promised them a special land. He said it was going to be a land that was abundant. It was going to be filled with fruits and grains and all kinds of things. They, the phrase he used was milk and honey, which means lots of good stuff. And because of disobedience, because of stubbornness, God sent them out to walk around in the desert for 40 years until the, the unfaithful generation had died off. And finally, after 40 years, they get to the, to the banks of the Jordan River, and all they have to do is is to to receive what God had promised them is to cross the Jordan River. And it's so big. It's a huge deal. It's such an important part of the the day. It's an important part of what was going on. Everything that God had promised them was right before them, just across the river. It's so important that God tells Joshua, he says, here's what I want you to do. This is a marker moment in the history of Israel. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick up 12 stones from the middle of the river, and I want you to stack them on the bank of the river as a memorial to this special moment to remember God's faithfulness and that God walked with them through the desert. He says, I want you to do that. Pick them up, take them over to the other side, and build a, a monument out of 12 stones. Why 12? The 12 tribes of Israel. I want to pick up the story in Joshua chapter 4. Right there, and we're going to read a couple of verses. And he says this, he said, he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants, your kids, ask their fathers, and let me just tell you, parents, your kids are going to ask about God's faithfulness in your life. It will come back to you, I promise. When the kids ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground right here. God's deliverance. God's faithfulness, God's power, the fact that he was with them in these moments. He's trying to get them to realize that there are marker moments in our lives that we have to be aware of. Marker moments that we want to be sure to have to go back to. He's a faithful God, isn't he? When you want to drift towards isolation, remember the things that God has done in your life. When you feel like wandering, when you're getting tired, when you're getting weary and tired of waiting, for maybe the healing or something else, when you think you cannot go on and you feel all alone, remember the faithfulness of God in the things that He's done in your life. The God who walked with His people is the same God who walks with you today. He is the same God who loves you just as much as He did when He walked with Him across the Jordan River. When you need provision, just like the children of Israel needed provision, He came through in your life. And I've heard story after story of God's provision in your lives. When you were trapped, he gave you a way out of a terrible situation. When you were dead in your sin, oh, aren't you thankful that he forgave you and gave you grace and mercy and love 
and forgiveness and a heavenly home. See, the first thing to fight the drift is to remember the faithfulness of God. So we need to acknowledge that there is some of us here today who'd say, yeah, but, you know, Pastor, I can't really see God's faithfulness in my past right now. I can't see it. And I I believe your statement. I believe that for some of you, it's hard to see because of the life maybe you've lived. Sometimes it's really hard to remember God's faithfulness. In in fact, if you're really honest, there's moments it, it, it doesn't look like God was faithful in your life at all. If you were to set up a monument of stones Here's what it might look like. If if you were to grab a monument of stones and you were to take them and pile them up, you might take one stone and set it out. And and that that stone right there probably would re- represented uh, maybe the fact that you were abandoned by your parents, by your biological parents, and you don't understand the why and the hurt and the pain and the, the feeling of of that you weren't enough. You, that may be a stone someone has in their life. There there may be another stone that someone else will pull out and and put down and. They may set that stone up as a monument, and and that stone says to them that I I trusted an individual in my life, and they abused me. And the pain that has gripped me since I was a child continues to hurt. That's what I see in my life. Or, Or maybe you grab another stone, and you may have a stone that's set up that looks a little different, and and this one here may be the fact that you watched a loved one die in your life, in the pain and the hurt of seeing them go through that has just gripped you. And watching them lose that fight has been hard for you. That may be a stone that you put up in your life. And and it it, it may be that you have a a stone in your life where you made the biggest mistake of your life. And I don't know what that is, but you made a huge mistake that has haunted you for the rest of your life. It destroyed maybe your life. And the guilt and the shame of that mistake rests heavy on you. And so that may be your stone. We all have stones in our lives to look at. We all have things in there. And and each and every one of us, when we we pull out our stone, it may look different, but we all have them. You know, for, for Joshua, his stones represented the faithfulness of God. What are your stones representing in your life? There's times that we've been through moments when it feels as if we've traveled those moments all alone, just by ourselves. And sometimes it's, it's hard to remember God's faithfulness, even though he was there. And, and that's when you realize that you never stand alone, that he was always there with you. And that's why the second thing we do to fight against the drift is we rely on God's people. We rely on each other. Isn't that important? Relying on each other because We have each other right here to be encouraged by. We all need somebody, don't we? Everybody needs somebody. We need godly people in our lives. Sometimes we need godly people to vent to. Just somebody you can go unload on and go, you're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. I promise. Let me pray with you. Right? We all need that. We all need someone to share maybe some of our doubts, some of our fears with. Uh, we, we all need someone to be able to share those painful moments with, knowing that they're going to be there for you. Your doubts, I'm just going to tell you, your doubts don't disqualify you. You realize that? Somebody needs to hear that today. Your doubts don't disqualify you. They make you human. See, we all need somebody. But let me just say, you don't need just somebody. You need somebody who won't judge you but someone who has good judgments. Sometimes, right? You need the right people in your life. Have you ever gotten advice from the wrong person? (laughs) Come on, have you? We've all been there, right? I remember uh, Teresa and I were leading a small group in our last church. The small group was designed around marriage encouragements. And this particular study we were doing in, and uh, I, I, was, I was remembering this moment when one of the guys came in early from, for, for small group, and he was so excited because he and one of the other guys from the small group had gone out fishing last week. And he's like, it's just awesome. You know, so-and-so had just, we went fishing, and we were talking. Man, he gave me some amazing marriage advice. 
I am just so excited about it, man. And I'm just really looking forward to it. And he told me the guy's name. And I'm like, okay, can we just qualify this for a minute here? Let's step back and realize that he's been married three times. Do you really want marriage advice from a guy who's been married three times and can't seem to get the one he's got going in the right direction? Maybe you need advice from a guy who's been married once and is doing it all right. Don't you think? See, advice isn't always a good thing if it's coming from somebody who doesn't quite get it. You know what I mean? You need to rely on the right people in your life because the difference between them and you are when God wants you to be and depends on having the right people in your life to be able to share with you the right things, to be able to open up and be able to give you some of the things that you need in your life. Some of you might say, you know what, I'm not alone. I've got people in my life. I've got peeps. You know, i got people in my life from way back. It's awesome. And I'm like, okay. I had somebody actually tell me that a while back. I said, you know what, uh, I've been struggling with porn, but that's it. I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I've, I've, I've had it, and, and, and I'm done with it. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's great. I'm really excited for you. Uh, I said, so, so tell me. Tell me a little bit. I said, so. Who do you have in your life that you can go to when you might struggle? Because you might. And I just want to know who's in your life. He goes, oh, you know what? I got my high school buddies. We've been buddies for like 25, 30 years now. It's awesome. And, uh, you know, they promise that they never bring the porn out when I'm around. So it's going to be A-OK. And I'm like, oh, really? That's the best you got. See, having people in your life doesn't necessarily mean a good thing, Right? Wrong people will lead you to the wrong result, won't it? But right people, not only will they bring you to the right result, but they'll help you to get moving in the right direction. And that's critical in our lives. See, the difference between you, where you are, and where God wants you to be is having the right people in your life. So many times I have found in talking with individuals that their life direction has been has been altered by people who were well-meaning, who gave wrong advice, who were not intent on what God had, but what they had. In fact, Proverbs 14, 7, I love the scripture. It says this. All right. It says the words of the wise are like weapons of knowledge. Great. I love it. Right. If you need wise counsel, stay away from the fool. Don't you just love it when Scripture says it plain? If you need wise counsel, don't ask an idiot. Don't ask a fool. Stay away from the fool. And many of you have ringing in the back of your heads, your mama's voice, your mama. Mama done told you to stay away from that fool, right? And and ladies are like, oh, but I can change him. I can help him, right, ladies? No. Stay away from the fool. Scripture says it's simple and plain. Get away from the fool. Run. Run, people. You need to find the right people to speak into your life. Not just to listen to you, but to point you in the right direction. It's one thing to have somebody just to hear. It's another who can give you wise counsel. Because words of the wise are like weapons of knowledge. And knowledge is a great thing, isn't it? So, how do you find the right people? Do they actually exist? Ah, there's, yeah, there's some out there. If, if you're a part of Levin and First Assembly here, I want to give you three simple ways for you to be able to maybe uh, find uh, some right people or your tribe, if you will. So there's three ways to find right people. Three ways to find right people. The first one is this right here. I'll be short and brief with this, okay? First one is start serving. You're like, what? Start serving. You need to find people walking in the same direction that you want to be walking, right? Sometimes the best way to get through difficult times in your life is to focus on serving someone else because you get so caught up in your head with what you're thinking and how you're living and what your life is like that you forget that there are others around you. And when you begin to give, God begins to, it opens up and releases you to be able to receive from him. So the first is start serving. The second way that you can find the right people is this, get in a small group, get in a small group. Find a group of people that's, and you're like, why? I come on Sunday mornings. It's awesome. I can sneak in right before service starts. Nobody's going to talk to me. It's awesome. And then I can sneak out right as you hit that altar moment, and I don't got to deal with nobody. Why do I need a small group? That's why you need a small group. Because in a small group, you look at them eyeball to eyeball, and you go, so how you really doing? Hmm? What's going on? 
You know, you start getting real with people. You start talking about the, the things that are going on in their lives, and it's a safe space where you can get honest and pray together and encourage one another. And, and the, the small groups that we've been in have been so amazing because we celebrated, we celebrated births together. Uh, as a family, we, we, we celebrated deaths. We had some deaths in one of our small group and uh, untimely deaths, not, not deaths that were planned, but I mean, just, and, and it was hard, but we were able to walk together. We did life together as a small group. And it was an amazing, amazing thing. Get in a small group, find your tribe, a group of people who you can meet with consistently, pray with consistently, walk through your faith journey together who are going to help point you in the correct direction of your life. And the third way to find the right people here at Eleven and First Assembly is to get real with someone. What? That's right. Get, get real with someone. See, your small group, you're in, you're, let's just say you're in a small group and you're serving somewhere, but you're isolated in your problems because you don't ever really get honest, right? You don't share. You don't wear. You, uh, some of you are real good at wearing the church mask. Anybody ever seen those church masks? Well, oh, praise God, bless God, and Jesus loves you, right? How you doing? I am blessed, highly favored of God. Yeah, we're yeah, really, how you doing? I am blessed. I'm, it's, it's like they've got this mask on. that they, they think they're hiding the fact that they're behind on their bills and, and they're, they're hurting because their marriage is falling apart, but I can't let anybody know because I'm blessed and highly favored of God. You know what? Get honest and get real. You're alone. You're isolating it's time to share your struggles with someone who can point you in the right direction. Get honest with your struggles. A trusted individual, not just any individual. You have to realize that, yes, you've got to be picky about who you share your struggles with. It's important. I've seen it over and over. Things begin to change in your faith journey when you start serving. Things begin to change when you get into a small group and you start growing in your faith walk with God and you start living it out each day with others around you. You start getting real with people and helping you through some of your struggles and you begin to work with others as well. And you'll look back and you'll see that that's a stone in your life. And you'll find your people and you'll find your tribe and you'll find it someplace that you can stand on as a monument rather than a tombstone. How many of you would rather have a monument than a tombstone? See, we were created for connection, weren't we? But we drift towards isolation. We've got to fight against the drift. So how do we win the fight against the drift toward isolation? I've told you th two things so far. The first was remember the faithfulness of God, right? The second one was rely on God's people. And here's the third today, and the final thing. And that is you need to release the power of your story. You realize your story is important. See, everybody needs God, right? And everybody needs somebody, right? But Maybe somebody needs you, and you keep not being that individual they may need. You have a story, and it matters to God. Your story is important. Your story is something that can help others to walk through the struggles they're going through, because you may have already journeyed through that path, and they need to know that there's light at the end of that tunnel. They need to understand that there's power in your story, and when you share it, it's, it's something that releases in you, but it's also something that releases in somebody else. Never underestimate how God can use your story for what he has in other people's lives because it's very real. I want to share with you one last Bible story. Many of you know the story of David and Goliath. Love that story, right? In fact, my dad preached on that a while back and had me up on a ladder, so I was just about nine foot nine inches tall and let me just say that was a long ways up there. I'm six foot three, but three more feet higher was a long ways up there, right? So anyway, uh, so let me just give you the quick synopsis of the story to bring you together in my context. We have the Israelites versus the Philistines, okay? We have Goliath on the scene. Goliath is nine foot nine inches tall. He's a seasoned warrior. Sound effects are really important for that. That was him taking steps, if you didn't catch that. Nice. That was good, buddy. That's okay. No, that, that worked. Yeah, he probably stumbled. That was your... Okay, so we're, we're good. We're good. And then we have David. David was a, a, about 15-year-old young man. He'd only been a shepherd. He'd never been a warrior. 
the cool thing about this is that I just want to say this. Age does not define exactly the impact of any story, does it? It does not. He was not a warrior. And David comes in and he hears this really tall guy shouting terrible things about his God. And he says, I'll fight this guy. Nobody else is going to do it. I'll fight him. I'll take him on. And so what does David do? David goes to a nearby brook. And they were in the Valley of Elah. By the way, we stopped in the Valley of Elah while we were on our tour in Israel. And we went to the, the place where he picked up his stones. And yes, I picked up stones. Got them in my office. That's right. In case I ever need my sling. Picked up his five stones. And he put them in his pouch. And he goes out to meet Goliath on the battlefield. And what does David do? And he declares who he's fighting for. And he puts a stone into the chamber of his sling. Right? It was a shotgun sling, right? He winds that thing up and he releases it, launches a stone at Goliath, nails him in the forehead, knocks him unconscious. David goes up, draws out Goliath's sword, right? And he cuts off his head and defeats the giants. What's interesting in this story is that Goliath wasn't David's personal giant, was he? David wasn't a warrior. He, he came to check on his brothers for his dad. Goliath didn't defy David. He defied God's people who happened to be David's people. So there's a connection here. See, when you're my people, your giant becomes my giant. There's power in your story. See, your struggle becomes my struggle. Your pain becomes my pain. What's hurting you is hurting me. It's hurting us because we are a tribe. We care. See, David picked up five smooth stones, right? Why are river stones so smooth? They don't all start out smooth. They typically start out pretty jagged. And it's the constant agitation, the tough moments, the tumbling, knocking up against other stones, the, the constant rolling, the waterfalls, and all the things they go through, which acts as a sandpaper to begin to clean those stones up, knocking off the rough edges and the, so that they become smooth and soft, if you will. That's what our lives, walking through some of the things that we go through, does for us. And that's where, when we share our story of a jagged edge in our life that got knocked off, can encourage somebody else who's still tumbling through the water. Having those edges bumped and knocked and hit, feeling like, is this ever going to end? And you tell your story, and you're able to show them the smoothness of the stone. And they're like, wow, I can do this. It can happen for me. So if I go back and I look at the stones in my life or your life or someone's life, we look back and we see that that divorce that almost broke you, if you will, didn't break you. You're still here. You're still alive. You're still serving God. And those edges are a little smoother. Maybe you pick up another stone in your life and you look at that business venture that you took on that failed. You're like, you thought for sure that the end was near at that point. But now as you look back, you realize, you know what? That turned out pretty good. Yeah, I learned some stuff along the way, but I'm all right. Or maybe the stone you pick back up and you look at is the addiction that almost killed you. As you hold that up and you look at that and you think about what, how many jagged stones were knocked off as, a, as God worked you through that addiction and brought you to healing in your life how it can really touch you. Maybe it's the grief of a child you lost, the pain that comes with that. And I know the pain's probably still there, but you've come to terms with it that the child is all right in heaven. And the stone that had these awful sharp edges that kept cutting and hurting, don't cut. They're now a little more smooth. 
See, the story you have, the monuments you share, the moments you have in your life have power. What the enemy meant for evil in your life, and, and I know you've heard this before, what he meant for evil, God will turn for good. We know that God works all things together for them who love God and are called according to his purpose. And we know that anybody is called by God. And perhaps you can finally recognize that your story can be the stone that takes down somebody else's giants. Your story can have an impact in somebody's life like you've never dreamed before. But as long as you keep hiding your story, it can never slay a giant. See, God's building his church, isn't he? Stone by stone, gift by gift, work by work, person by person. He's building that up in us. You have to finally recognize that your story has power to be willing to share it. So we've got to fight against the drift towards isolation because when we isolate, we never share our stories. When we isolate, it's because we're fearful or ashamed or we're hurt or we're lonely in it. We've got to open ourselves up. We've got to fight the drift towards isolation and live for the true connection that God has for us to live for. And if you share your story, it could impact a young man's life or a young woman's life that you've never, ever dreamed of impacting. You may change the course of their future and their history Ever, and for future generations who will be transformed by that. The impact you may have can be life-changing. And when you do that, when you begin to open that up, you then can realize that you never, ever in your life will stand alone because He is there with you through Him and through each of us. Would you stand with me today as we pray. Father, today, I pray that this can carry some impact in some lives today, realizing that you have something for us, God. And some of us feel that in our pain, in our hurt, in our shame, that our story needs to be hidden. But God, I pray that we can realize that you have saved us from our stories, that you've healed us from our pains, and there's power to be shared in it. Lord, help us to realize you're always with us. You're always walking with us, Lord, in every way. You're faithful to us, God. We can rely on the people around us that are godly, that you put in our lives. And Lord, we can come to the understanding that there's power in the story that we have of our life. Let us be those kind of people for others. Sing this together, will you? All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Can you lift your hands and sing it then? All my life you have been faithful. Faithful Lord. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am able, I will see of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. When my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. You know, today as you're here, your heads are bowed for just a moment. Time of reflection for us. 
And today you might want to be, you may be here and you may be wanting to say, you know what, I, I want to win the fight in my life against isolation because I know that I am doing that. And, and I, I, I really want God's help in my life on that. Or maybe you may be saying, I, I need some right people in my life. I've been leaning into the wrong individuals and they, they don't lead me and point me in the right direction. Or, or maybe you're saying to yourself, I, I want to have the courage to share my story today. I want to share, I want to be able to use the, the smooth stones that God has put in my life to be able to touch others' lives. And if that's you today, would you just lift a hand up and say, yeah, Pastor, can you just be praying for me? I really want that in my life. There's one of those areas that I just need to, or maybe it's two areas, you know, or maybe all three areas, that I just need that in my life today, and I've got to begin to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. So much. Father God, you see those hands. You understand those hearts and exactly where they are, because, Lord, you are right there with them. And you understand them. And God, I pray that you begin to help them to make changes needed in their life. To begin to be who you need them to be in their life. Touch them today, God, I pray. Encourage them today, God, I pray. Minister to them through the moments that have been revealed to them that they can stand with you knowing that you've got them where they're at, God. Touch them today, Lord, I pray. You know, today... For those of you in the house, the most important connection you could probably ever make in your life is your connection with God. You've been walking this life alone. Maybe you're standing here today and you're walking without God. And you may ask, why in the world do I need Christ in my life? I don't understand that, Pastor. On your own, here's let me tell you, on your own, you can never be good enough. I don't care how amazing of a person you are. Without Christ, you could never satisfy the debt that is there for your sin. It's impossible. It's impossible for me to do it. But Christ came as a pure Son of God who willingly took on our mess, our sin, our yuck, and He paid the penalty that was due on your behalf. Jesus was crucified. He was buried. And three days later, he rose from the grave. And he's there to be a risen Savior for you and for me and our lives. And for us to receive that price that was paid, we have to be willing to accept what Christ has offered to us and what he's done for us. And becoming a follower of Christ is receiving him as your Lord and Savior. And today you'd say, you know what, Pastor? I've never understood that before. But I need a Savior in my life. I'm walking this alone and this is, this is really... I'm a hot mess and I need Jesus today. Or, or, you know what, I have realized that my way is not God's way. And you would say, Pastor, can we pray today? I need to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. If that's you and you're here or maybe you're online, you would say, that's me. Pastor, can you pray with me? Would you just lift a hand up and say, yeah, yeah, I need Jesus in my life as a Savior today. I need him in my heart. I, thank you. I need to receive him in a way like never before because I am not living out what he has given to me to live out. I'm doing it on my own. Is there anyone else before we pray today that would say, yep, that's me, Pastor. Can you pray with me today? I'm going to invite everybody to pray with me together. And I'm just going to tell you the prayer that, that I'm praying is there's no secret words in this prayer. There's no magic words. It's merely me trying to put to into words, into the how you are hearing from God and, and how you need Him in your life. And, and so today, I'm just going to pray from my heart, and I, I would love for you, as well as everyone in this house, to repeat this prayer after me. You say, Pastor, why everybody? Because I don't want anybody to ever pray alone in this place. I want everybody to have somebody praying with them. So today, if you would join with me as we pray this prayer, for those who have acknowledged their need for Christ, that would be wonderful. Say, Dear Lord Jesus... I give you my life, all of it, not just my Sunday life, but every day of the week life. Touch me, God. Cleanse me, God. Forgive me, Lord. I'm so sorry. I believe in you. I believe in your son and the price he paid for my life. And I receive that forgiveness into my life. I receive his grace and his mercy. Help me to live my life for him. 
each and every day that I can walk with him and know that I'm never alone. Lord, let me use my story someday to encourage somebody else in their faith journey. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Will you put your hands together today as we celebrate what God is doing in lives and hearts? 